Call the meeting to order. Tom Duster. Here. Uh, Scott Holwick. Here. Roger Lane. Here. Renee Davis. Here. Dan Wolford. Here. Ken Hewson. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Hope Bartlett. Here. Chris Huffer. Here. Um, Heather McIntyre is here. And then we have other staff with us, Brian McGill. Here. And then Kate Medina. Here. And Becky Doyle. Here. Here. Councilmember Martin. Yes, here I am. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, let's start with approval of the previous month's minutes. Any questions or comments on last month's minutes? Is there a motion to approve? Yeah, we move to approve the minutes from this month. Okay, thanks, Scott. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Very good. Okay, can you want to do water staff? Sure. Um, blow up the same rain this morning. Uh, 16 CFS, 125 year historic library. Um, 38 CFS. Um, the following is the same Creek is the Eugene's Ditch, uh, which has a priority date of June 30th, 1868. The column on the South Platte River is Jackson and the Inlet Ditch, with a priority date of uh, December 6th, 1995. Um, the Alpha Reservoir, Button Rock, is preserved as full and spilling with approximately one tenth more of the spillway, which is approximately 60,240 acre feet. Uh, Union Reservoir is at an ele elevation of 24.6 feet or 10,345 acre feet, and that's down approximately 2,428 acre feet. Uh, basin reservoirs uh, at the end of September were at 73.7%. Okay, thanks for questions for Ken. All right. Don't be we heard. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'll tee it up. The first thing I wanted to do is um, for those who might not have met before, Dave. Hornbacher is down at the end of the table here. He's our um, director of the utilities, all the utilities department. Yeah. <laughs> you want to introduce yourself a little more? <laughs> yeah, I could. You, you could think of me having assumed a role like Dale, but without the parks and the open space part. So it's just all the utilities and public works and so forth and engineering. I just wanted to come in and say hi and thank you for all of your time and service here. It's a very, very important role. And so I'm just gonna sit in and just listen and understand better what, you know, how the meetings go. I do have another meeting at four, so if I leave a little early, it's not because of the meeting at any means. So I just want to call and stop in and say hi. Hello. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> our special presentation, Lord may recall, um, as we were looking at some of the issues surrounding our cash and loot last month, a couple questions came up about exactly how we um, fund the different aspects of our water system. And uh, Becky's uh, role is a strategic integration um, manager and has some of her folks with her. Uh, they are the ones who really kind of help work through all of our financial aspects of the, of the department. And uh, so they're going to give us a presentation on how we, the different ways we fund. I think that will help answer a lot of the questions that came up concerning cash and move because cash and move really is just part of the overall budgeting system. So I'll turn it over to Brian. Brian's uh, going to give our presentation today and go from there. Okay. Hello everybody, my name is Brian McGill. I'm the Utility Rate and Analysis Manager with Strategic Integration. And I apologize in advance, we did have a Raven Martin, our rate analyst, originally was gonna give this presentation, but she's home sick today. So I'm pinch hitting for her. So it's not gonna be as polished as we had hoped it would be, but hopefully I can convey what we're trying to present today. So 
did you want to say anything, mm -hmm. Becky? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, as Ken said, we're going to give a, a, a presentation on the water utilities finances and an overview of how those are put together. So this first slide is just a fund overview of the different funding sources for the water utility. Um, there are three different funds. There's the water cash acquisition fund, the water construction fund, and then the water operating fund. And so what's inside those bubbles is the, uh, the revenue sources for the different funds. And then to the far right, is what those revenues can actually, what kind of expenditures those revenues can actually cover. So the water cash acquisition fund, the revenue there is this the cash in lieu um, fee that's paid for by developers. And that fee is just an option for development. If they do not have um, their own water rights that they can bring with them. Um, and that revenue can only be used for expenses associated with increasing the water supply. Then in the water construction fund, um, that's the revenue generated in that fund is the system development fees, and that's paid for by developers um, for development and redevelopment within the city. And those fees um, are to buy into the existing system, the water system that currently exists, and we'll go over the calculation for each of these in just a little bit as well. And then those revenues can only be used for the expansion of the water system. And then the final fund in the water utility is the water operating fund. And that is covered, the revenue there is rates for the most part. And then there's some other miscellaneous type revenues that go in there as well. And then that revenue can be used for all other operating costs. Uh, one other note though is the water acquisition fund and the water construction fund. We know that those revenues are not sufficient to cover, to cover the entire cost for increasing the water supply and for expanding the water system. So portions of those type of expenses are also built into the electric, I mean electric, the water rates, sorry. <laughs> okay, next slide. So I don't, I don't know when it's appropriate to ask. Oh, yes, 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 yes. 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 Um, if you go back to the previous slide, can you give maybe just like some examples of like increased water supply, expand water system, right? There seems like there could be some overlap there. So part of the water system, for example, might be a dam or a reservoir that would, you know, firm some of our water supply or something. So how do those distinctions get made and how is that kind of teased apart in some way? Mm -hmm. um, I'll take that question. Okay. <laughs> so when we say increased water supply, we really mean to purchase water rights or to undertake actions that um, I mean, need to purchase water rights, so conservation programs are often funded through um, cash acquisition. And that is the most restrictive. Um, I would say um, very rarely and, you know, exactly one time have we used um, cash acquisition toward um, actual infrastructure, which was the firming project, which you know increased the, the firm yield of an existing water right. So that's kind of a really special case. In general, that was, that was CIL money was used for that. Yes, okay. yeah, for a portion for our, for a percentage that we can tie back to that increased yield. So there was a justification. There. Yes, yes, exactly. And in general, that's something that we do every time we kind of think about what, how we could share the costs between these funding sources is say, okay, so we're replacing a, uh, a, a water tank. And while doing that, we're going to increase the capacity of that tank by some percentage. Um, so, you know, if, if that's going to increase by 20%, then we could use 20% water construction funds, but the rest would really be operating because it's kind of a general thing. So um, having something to tie that justification back to is, you know, we usually have a memo to the file that's part of the project documentation that, that talks about how that split occurs. Um, okay, so I just gave you an example of the, the construction, but it really is, um, so when we say expand water system, we really mean increase the capacity of, of the system. So capacity in tanks, treatment capacity, or um, if we needed to increase the capacity of uh, the larger transmission lines within the city. Those would be the examples that we have for construction. 
So when you say system development fees um, and expand the water system, is there any element of buying into the existing system? Yes, that's exactly how the, the system development fee is, is set. So it's set like with a hybrid of, of new expansion costs and like buying in. So it's, it's set on the basis of the existing system value but the only allowable use of the funds is to expand the system. So it's system value over remaining capacity. Uh, no, it's system value over. It's, well, we'll get we'll get to it. Okay, in a second. Okay, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now we'll talk about how we set the rates and fees. Um, so really, rate set the rent setting. Sorry, rate setting process is really a cycle of looking at the plans we have and then that flows into setting of the rates which flows into the budget process and the implementation of those plans and it's really just a, a, a cycle of continuing to do that over and over again and so the business enablement team works with the project managers and engineers to ensure there are funds for plans for projects such as capital improvement projects, but also to cover the operating expenses associated with providing essential water services to the city. And then the rates ensure that sufficient revenue is collected and each year when we set the budget for the upcoming year, we review the revenue and the cost of providing service to the communities as well as cost of desired projects, which includes increased cost due to inflation or material costs associated with meeting new state and federal regulations. And then without sufficient budget, uh, projects may not be able to be implemented and you may need to delay certain projects, such as pipe replacement, which can be costlier in the future, especially if there is a significant event affecting infrastructure. And then also the budget helps to determine which projects can be funded and also helps plan for the future uh, years as we go through the budget setting uh, process. Next slide. Um, so one of the uh, financial basics is the a fund balance. And so a fund balance, each, each one of those funds that we talked up above on the second slide, um, they all have their own fund balance. And so to me, the fund balance kind of like to relate that back to personal finances is kind of your savings account. And so the way that's calculated is on any given year, um, if your revenues are in excess of your expenses, your total expenses, operating capital and debt service, then that would be a contribution to your fund balance. But if the expenses are more than the revenues you collect in any given year, then you would actually be using some of that fund balance. Yeah, so that's really plus equals fund balance, right? Because the fund balance doesn't start at zero every budget year. Correct, mm -hmm. correct, yeah, yeah. And, and this is true for, so each of the three funds are essentially uh, distinct in this case. And so each one of them have their own revenues, their own expenses that are distinct to that. Correct, correct. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now we'll get into the actual calculations of um, cash in lieu, system development fee, and the windy gap surcharge. So you all are familiar with the calculation of the cash in lieu. Um, and so it's calculated by taking the <coughs> cost of the parent Windy Gap projects plus the cost of the firming project divided by the firm yield. And that's how the cash in lieu is developed. And then just um, a couple notes here. Again, the revenue collected through cash in lieu is restricted only to increasing the water supply. And again, it's only a mechanism in the event that the developers are not bringing in their own water rights. Yeah, one question about this. So back when we were, whatever, we were 18,000 or something, right? This was three years ago. I don't know. Basically, about the day I started, whatever that was. <laughs> about the day I left. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, which one of these was not? It, we were basing that eighteen thousand only on the firming project because it was the most recent that 
uh, the decision was made that hey, well, in order to have something firm, we needed the, the parent project to begin with. Yep, next slide, please. Yeah, just one more question. This yep. formula is the not statutory, yep. but we can we can adjust it based on the market, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. The policy. Truly a policy. Okay, so system development fee. Um, again, these are the, the fees paid for the by the developers um, as they're either doing new development or redevelopment. And as Becky mentioned, um, this calculation is the value of the infrastructure, and it's really the replacement value of the infrastructure, minus any bond principal outstanding, divided by the single family equivalent units. And my understanding is the single family value, the equivalence is the average usage for a single family household. Okay. Okay. Um, and so this revenue again is uh, restricted for the expansion of the water system infrastructure. And the sixty five hundred. This thing varies. Uh, what's the sixty? What's the sixty five hundred represent right now for a single family? How big a development are you talking about? I believe that's a single family home with about a 5,000 square foot lot. So there's a there's a lot size component, which is why this is approximately 6,500. But the the kind of the, the existing sort of indoor use component is about 3,500. And then there's a there's a per square foot charge. Thanks. Okay, next one is the windy gap surcharge. Um, so the calculation for this one is the value of the Windy Gap infrastructure, both parent and firming. Um, again, minus the bond principal outstanding associated with that project. Um, and then again, divided by the single family equivalent units. And the revenue collected through this surcharge is restricted to paying back that Windy Gap uh, bond. So, my big question though is how is this not a double dip? Walk me through. Yeah. So a double dip meaning charging twice for those same asset. Yes. So the Windy Gap surcharge is really for to support payment of our costs for firming our existing water right. So it's kind of within the Windy Gap project. Um, this generates in the, on the order of about $300,000 a year, which doesn't quite get to the level of, of our debt payment for Windy Gap, but it, it contributes toward it. Okay. So the difference between the Windy Gap surcharge, which is for our share of the infrastructure, and the cash and loop calculations. The cash and loop calculation uses some of the same numbers, but it's really thinking about what would be like a new unit of Windy Gap and the cost to get that to a user such you know as such as the city so I think of it as you know system development fees when you have surcharge like that's for the the pipes and the infrastructure cash and loom is for the water that's flowing through them so it is a little odd that we're using similar costs to get to both of those things maybe but it, it really is for two different things that uh, make that water useful. So I'm trying to wrap my head around it because I want to get kind of specific. So you are saying that the cash and lose for the water rights element. Yes. And that that portion of the asset, this windy gap surcharge is for the some hardware infrastructure. Yeah. Gives yeah. Okay. For our share of that Thank infrastructure. You. Based on what we have today in the water right. Yeah. Is it not also though like thinking kind of future versus past. So isn't cash and new about going out and obtaining new yes. supply if we need it? Yes. And this surcharge is about paying off the bond that we've already paid or, or for the money that we've already paid to, to be participants in this project. Now, if, now, if I could maybe go one step beyond, um, it might be easier to think of the cash, the cash in lieu 
is, is not set up to pay for Windy Gap or any other project. The cash in lieu is to make, so some developers, mo, many most developers come in with water, three acre feet of acre per, three acre feet of water per acre. <clears throat> the cash in lieu is really just to say, okay, everybody else has brought in three acre feet, you've only brought in two acre feet, so if you don't have water, you can give us cash in lieu of bringing that water. So really the cash in lieu is only to bring everybody up it's the same level playing field at the time of annexation and having of their property. And um, it is just by happenstance, by policy, we made the policy. So years ago, um, 20 years ago and earlier, we based cash and move on the price of CBD. CBD went up, <laughs> skyrocketed. So we made a policy decision that we would use um, the parent of the when you got firming project. But that went you know, along for probably 10 or 15 years, and we decided, well, really, we made a policy decision to use the parent project and the firming project as a complete water project. That's where the 48,000 comes from. But it's not designed to go out and get you water rights or get water as much as it is designed to keep everybody low. We could, we could go back to, CBD water, we could use Native Basin. It, it's really a policy decision that happens to be when you get. But what that does is it brings everybody to the same level playing field, three acre feet per acre of land that you annex and develop the bottom line. Then once you have annex and develop, then you have the actual cost of buying into the systems. When you get up surcharge, again, it just happens to be the same as cash and loop. It is really to help us pay off the bonds. Uh, originally, it was to pay off the bonds of the parent project. But once that got paid off in 2017, we didn't have it really for two years. And then we end up with more bonds because of the firming project. So now we, from 2019, I think we'll have 30 years, I believe, or 20 or 30 years, 20 years to pay off that, um, that bond. And that's what that surcharge will be, the lead expire at the end of that 20 year period. So it's really um, everybody buy into the same system at both levels, but it, it's much more directed towards a physical component, the surcharge is, the Windy Gap project, as opposed to the cash and loot, which we just made the policy decision to, to use the Windy Gap. And it's, a, it's an index, it's not directly paying for that. Now, once that cash flow comes in, then we then the city ha has the opportunity to use it for whatever we want. Um, we use it for water conservation, we use it for buying water rights. Um, we will use some of it for paying off the bonds on um, Windy Gap. Um, it, any expenses we have for increased water supply. Whatever we want related to the water right. system. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, I, I, I can't use, use it for down payment <laughs> assessment it's for low income housing. Yeah. And, yeah. and within that it, it even is narrowed down to a different fund with a, with a specific fund with an even narrower purpose, correct? Sorry, Peter would be better. So the cash and loot is really basically for rights yeah. and rights firming. Yes. Okay. And so it's not necessarily for water treatment product. No. Right. That would not be inappropriate. Yeah. But, and you can see how the calculation is different. And the, the surcharge here is on a like a per per household or per per equivalent unit basis, whereas looking at the cash in it's kind of bringing it down to what would a you know, per acre foot look like trying to establish that market rate. Yeah, that, and I think Becky makes a really good point. It may help us to think, you know, the calculation for cash flow is based upon the index of what what is I think for water work. I suppose the other two calculations are basically what's the system when you plug your your water line into our system you get the benefit of a very valuable system and so both of those calculations when you have surcharge and construction are based on the value of the system that you plug your pipe into the citizens have that it's their their system and you can pay for the value of that system I think the challenge here is like 
that I mean, it's a good thing. It's not, it's not a challenge that Longmont has been so proactive in thinking about our water needs in the future that it's not like we're in some kind of situation where a new housing development comes up, they pay cash and blue, and then we say, oh great, finally we have some money and we can go out and buy a water right to feed that housing development or to provide that housing development with water, right? And so it's not, there's like separation in the transactions here, right? And so, for example, I mean, I don't know the answer to this, actually. When was the last time that Longmont just went out and bought some water? Ever? Oh. Um, like, I, mean, like, I don't remember that discussion. Ever. We rarely just simply go out and buy a water right. Um, a lot of the water rights we could have bought more recently have been part of land acquisition. We've we acquired land around Union Reservoir, so we bought a number of, we bought some water rights around there. Our open space department, of course, when it buys open space, buys water rights, but that stays on the open space. But yeah, um, and yes. then and then you know whenever they can provide the sort of water rights, they they do. Exactly. And, and so then, but but there's just this separation in these transactions, you know, because we are kind of using what is supposed to be kind of almost what I think of in my mind as being kind of like. Uh, proactive, right, like going out and getting water to provide to like a housing development. We basically just said, well, we have that water already. And so then you're free to use that cash and do to for past decisions in, in a way. And yeah. so there's a kind of disconnect in that. It, in it helps a little bit, um, but keep in mind, the bulk of our cash and lieu, at least more recently, went towards paying off when you have farming project. So that gave us firm water. And I can't remember, Becky, it was three or four billion dollars of cash in the fund. Seven. Seven million, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it probably took us 20 years to get that. <laughs> Seven million dollars for the community gap. Yeah. We also use it for water conservation. So that's water that now we don't have to put exactly. it out somewhere. <clears throat> so we can take that conserved water and, and use it. Yeah, I, in, with respect to Tom's project, pro questions rather, I, I wonder if um, it doesn't help to get away from the economic principle that we all grew up with of thinking of water as a free good. It hasn't been that for a real long time. And um, so, because I think at the bottom of your question, Tom, is well, why are we charging so much for water we already have? And, and uh, we're, we're not, what I think of it more like the cost of storage or the cost of in electricity, you know, you, you have to pay to store it and we have to pay to firm the windy gap water rights. You have to, you have to pay, at, you know, as you, as you use it. And I like to think of this as an insurance policy because a water right is not the same as water. You know, water rights may not, may not, if, if there's a change in the weather, they may not flow in uh, with the amount of, the, like what's happening to the Colorado River now, correct? I think that might help. Yeah, and well, and just to be clear, I mean, I, I think that we are in such a good position that sometimes it causes problems, I can imagine, right? Like, that, that like, that we have been so proactive. I say we, like I took part in this, but, but essentially, <laughs> but that you all have been so proactive that you have done such a great job of securing a, a future that that when we're thinking about like what the future looks like and, and the ways in which we kind of like program the future or something, that the way that that becomes like a difficult thing to kind of describe. If you're not in a crisis all the time, it's hard to decide, it's hard to, Describe how you're using the money that people are taking in. You know, if like it's just like it, it, I mean, could go back to the household analogy, right? Like if you're saving, it's hard to suggest how it is that you're like using money in a way. You know, like um, so. So anyway, I, I mean, I'm 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 impressed with the way in which we have you know continual continually planned for the future uh, around here, um, and so. I just think that the, so sometimes the um, marketing or something of that idea or the kind of get the word out kind of um, 
maybe it, it's a complicated business so that means I hate to keep holding up this, this discussion, but the last time the public got upset about the way we charged it was when we changed the Windy Gap search up or the Windy Gap formula and they were on the opposite side of the discussion. They said, hey city, you're leaving way too much money on the table here. CBT costs this much and <coughs> our fee in lieu is way down here. You guys fix that. So I don't think the public has a problem with us charging <laughs> developers. I really don't. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how do we spend the revenue that we collect? Uh, so this is a representation of an annual uh, water utility budget, and the thing that we just wanted you to focus on was the pie chart, and that. 63% of the total expenses go towards operating expenses. 19% um, go to uh, capital improvement program or projects. And then the remaining 18% goes to debt service. Next slide, please. So then this is, uh, oh. Okay. This pie chart is just a, a further breakdown of the orange slice of the pie from the previous chart. Um, and so you can see that a lot of expenses go towards wages and benefits and some professional contracted services. And then there's just other little slices as well. Next slide. Okay, so then that 18% that goes to uh, debt service um, we did just earlier this year make the final payment towards the state revolving fund loan. Um, then there's also the 2021 revenue bonds, and those were used for uh, treatment and distribution improvements. And then you can see the bottom one is the 2021 A revenue bonds, which were the, for the Windy Gap Farming and Chimney Hollow Reservoir project. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we do our annual budget? Um, next slide. So this is a little flow chart of the actual budget process. Um, we start the process by doing a revenue forecast based on the existing rates and the projected numbers of customers and projected consumption for the year. And then we uh, work with uh, leadership and um, engineers to develop an operating expense budget and also a capital um, expenditure budget. And then we looked and make sure that the forecasted revenues are sufficient to cover those expenditures. And if we need to, we can go back and adjust operating um, expenses as need be, or if we notice that the revenue is not sufficient to cover the expenditures, then that's when we would undergo a uh, rate study. Next slide, please. Okay. So these are the main drivers for when we go to do our capital planning. Um, not only do we look at the projected growth and water demands, but there's other things that go into those plans as well. Um, making sure that we can meet regulatory requirements, um, make sure that we have funds to take advantage of technological and innovation advances. And then another big piece of it is just looking at the aging infrastructure and making sure we're able to replace that in a timely manner. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the, um, as we're working with the project managers and engineers, we create a prioritization matrix. Um, and these are some of the factors that go into that prioritization matrix, and then the percentages are the weighting that we've assigned to each of these different factors. Um, and those factors are asset condition, whether or not we're able to meet regular regulatory requirements, also trying to reduce risk, and also meet the future capacity needs. Um, and so then we, we look at this list, um, sorry, 
Yeah, so then all these factors are taken into consideration while we're preparing the annual budget and also trying to keep an eye out on the future capital needs. Next slide, please. So this is just a visual representation of the various assets and also the forecast or replacement costs based on the current condition and life expectancy. What are the periodic peaks and so yeah. uh, that as, presumably those are planning rides and events or something? Uh, yeah, so so the, the really large spikes you see there are, are are higher intensity capital projects. I believe the pink ones are treatment and the blue ones are water supply. So that big blue thing that we had kind of in that 2020 region that that is our investment in the windy gap firming project and then we assume that there's about a 50 year life before we may have to make another significant investment in renewing the reservoir um, so kind of similarly the those spiky pink things are really about kind of the renewal of um, treatment assets um, according to their age whereas most of the other kind of smaller things and, and in particular those that that uh, wavy blue piece there is really the distribution line and, and all the, the age of, of different pipes coming out according to the pet type. Yeah, send us all that. <laughs> yeah, it's <that's laughs> too much fun to not take a picture of it. <laughs> and also, the, we're updating this continually. I mean, this is a snapshot of uh, when we did this last month. But, uh, it may have been a couple years since. But we're continually moving and readjusting based upon the current information. Yeah. Uh, expected. Right. Our biggest one, obviously, is the water treatment plant. The, the, the Which is that pink one there around 2030? Yeah, and we'll also have a pretty significant investment, probably a little sooner than that. It's not worth like yeah. there. You're not going to get it done in one year. No. Yeah. no. Uh, and the, the, the big orange storage spikes, which aren't as tall, but they're still significant, are those like tanks or are they like reservoir work? Tanks. So the reservoir is smaller than the supply. Okay. The dark blue. Yeah, I would imagine that you just kind of train your eye to, to knowing these things as you're looking at these as, as an expert, of course. And, but, but how do you then translate those episodic moments in time to kind of like to, to, to the reality of the situation, which is essentially that that's going to become presumably a bond that then gets paid over time, right? right. And yeah. so, so, so I guess you just kind of do that in your brain. You just say, well, that blue one, it'll just kind of come down and the bond payments will go up. So <laughs> what, what we do is, you know, annually, but very intensively, or when we do a rate study approximately every five years, we look at a 20 year horizon and say, okay, here's, here's what we know is coming due for replacement within this 20 year horizon. Are we on track to have revenue at a level to support either that replacement or you know, a debt instrument if that's required? Um, so that's really where it's useful. Can I point one thing out too on, on the graph? One of the, one of the things that's not quite as obvious in a water system is our underground pipes. You know, they're, they're very, you just really don't see them. But they, and, and there's a lot of them, you know, every foot of them isn't worth what a water plant is or a reservoir, but there's so many feet of them that it's a lot. If you, if you look at this, the general, this light blue, how much of the expenses that is, that's a real significant part in, in that, you know, how much you can replace each year is a, is a, is a big deal. Also, if you look, You'll notice what it does here. That's the age of the pipe. If you think about it, in 1965, they built IBM and Walmart started growing and we grew quite rapidly from the 60s to today. Well, those all those pipes in 2060 to 2090 are 100 years old. So that's what you're seeing there is the age of that pipe. Uh, and I hope you don't have to replace it all once, but <laughs> you know, um, that's that's an interesting part of, of, of having a community that didn't grow linearly over a few hundred years, but grew and then, <laughs> you know, is a hundred you know hundred years from that growth, then you have those pipes come due. That's a 
I think for me that's a little interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. And that dotted line there about the annual cost of sustainable ownership, that's really just taking an average of you know what should we be investing in the system just to manage the assets that exist today. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're getting there. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't hear you. Oh, sorry. So annual cost of sustainable ownership yeah. is, is really just sort of an average of what do we need to be spending over that whole time period in order to maintain existing assets. Should be a little north of 10 million. So what is the health of our infrastructure? I mean, how would you categorize it? Are we in good shape, average shape? Um, do we take good care of our existing facilities? We do, I don't know. Chris, <laughs> I'd say that, that we're at average um, right now. That some assets have been maintained better than others. I mean, we have a fairly new uh, water treatment plant in Nelson Flanders, and it is very robust. Uh, they spent money over the last few years uh, building a resiliency and redundancy in it. So uh, the water plant is in very good shape. Um, obviously our reservoirs and uh, some of our raw water infrastructure, we've been spending money on that as well. Um, I think they're in very good shape. Um, historically, and maybe it's kind of shown in that graph there too, we have not put as much time, money, and effort into our distribution system. Um, so it is, it is not failing by any means, but uh, it is coming to you. When I see huge water main breaks in Denver, I don't get too concerned, but I wonder about, I don't see many of those here in Longmont, actually, which is a good thing. Fortunately, we've had few, not, not too many, but they do happen. Um, just a week or so ago, there was one on Ninth Avenue um, that uh, our crews were very responsive to, and, we're able to get it all put back together in less than a day. So most of them don't disrupt uh, distribution and they don't disrupt uh, daily life. So so they don't become very obvious, I guess. So we don't have very many large lines like Tender does. We keep doing them some. Um, and if we had a break on one of those, it would be catastrophic and we'd hear about it. But we have cathodic protection on all of our steel lines that are larger. Uh, we have monitoring on all of them at this point in time as well. So um, it, it's very well maintained. But like I said, in, as Ken mentioned, they, they were put in a while ago. Everything has a life cycle to it. So. Thank you. Yeah. It would be good to be dead in 2017. <laughs> 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 I trust staff and uh, the city will address all of those well before 2070. So 2070 will be a great year. I hope so. Okay. Um, these are just some key financial metrics that we also take into consideration as going through the budget process. Uh, there's the reserve or cash on hand, as well as the debt service coverage and the debt to capital ratio, um, which is an important metric considered when we are seeking new bonds for capital improvement projects. Is it really going up or is that just a picture? I, <laughs> <laughs> AI just picked that. <laughs> okay, next slide. Cash reserve policy. Um, so, a cash reserve policy is important to have in place because uh, revenue for the water utility can vary from year to year based on if it's a wet or dry year. So in the wetter years, obviously the revenue's down because we aren't watering as much. Um, however, the real cost can stay very constant from year to year because we still have to operate the system as usual. Um, some of the costs do fluctuate based on how much it's used, but for the most part, that expense stays level from year to year as opposed to the revenue which can fluctuate and so having that healthy uh, that reserve policy then allows you to dip down into that fund balance um, in those years where you have less revenue um, and it just helps to ensure the health of the water utility through those highs and lows next slide please okay so then we just we're going to end the presentation again by just given that fund overview of the three funds, what those revenues are that go into each of those funds, and then the restricted um, expenditure types for those three different funds as well. This is just a repeat of the first slide, just in a little different format. 
think that's that wraps up our presentation. Uh, questions? Um, I, I do have a question. Um, so for s the system, I'm going to call it system development charges, but you call it system development fee. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have assets in there, right? And that's where your other water rights assets are? No, I don't believe that there are water rights assets in that calculation at all. Because we, we the city own more assets than the city of Mini Gap. Correct. Yeah, and all of that is is removed from that because the the cost. Well, <laughs> first of all, our water rights are the single biggest asset that the city owns. <laughs> Full stop. Yeah, and and everybody's contribution to that to our water rights portfolio is covered by um, the the raw water requirement. So either providing that historic water. Uh, other water rights that we accept or pay cash in lieu. So we don't charge again for the water rights because it, it all comes in that raw water requirement. And um, the city is looking for ways to incentivize behavior from residents, from developers, from industry, all of that. Oh, the first thing we go to is the connect fees of various sorts for various utilities and water is right up there in the front of the line. How do we do the calculation where we decide whether a fee waiver, which is a terribly valuable thing, um, is, is going to be too expensive for, for operational costs if we offer it? And, and how do we pr project the uptake rate on it? Because you know it might be a little expense, or it might be a big expense, depending on how many waivers we we end up doing. Mm -hmm. This is a great question <laughs> and relevant. So um, as we've been thinking about fee waivers, um, so Jimmy on Brian's team has been doing some uh, projections on uh, what we think. Um, you know, based on our, our goals for affordable and attainable housing units, how many units that we think are going to come in at that level, and sort of doing some stress testing, like, okay, if everybody comes in at an attainable level, and we have zero revenue from system development fees. Well, I mean, but we have to... Yeah, I know! <laughs> we have to set the, set the kind of the, uh, the, the bumpers on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know... Brian talked a little bit about how neither the, the cash in lieu nor the, the system development fees can fully fund at either of those sort of permissible areas. So we're always going to sort of depend on rates to make up the difference. Um, in this case, they're just taking up additional slack. Um, and, it's, you know, that, that additional um, funding will be reflected in future rate studies. Um, you know, depending on the number of fee waivers will depend on what that additional rate increase has to be to support them. And so in some ways, this is borrowing from the public. Yeah. Yeah. The rate payers under, under right any shortage in system development charges. Sure. So that's yeah. something that's been bothering me for a while. Yeah, it, it bothers me as well. Yeah. So, so that's that's always true when we think when we hear about a waiver it it, it comes from increases in, in rates that, that there's not like some magical money bond out there that we take from or something like that. Mm -hmm. no you know, that the the whole concept of, of you know the enterprise right having that utility that's well we're only charging what it costs to, to provide the service so we don't have okay. extra yeah. That would, yeah, that was the next question. Yeah, there's I no, there, there's, there's no, no profit that it digs into. Well, that, I guess that's what I mean, though, is like there's no slight padding to build up a fund that perhaps, I mean, obviously we just talked about the three funds and it wasn't included in one of these, right? But like there, there's not some small amount of padding that goes into building up some small amount of additional pool of money that then some of that. There are the cash reserves that, that, um, that Brian talked about. And we have some really specific reserve policies that, that dictate what, what we keep in that fund. 
Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a policy decision also about, you know, if we were to, to maybe require higher reserves um, for that purpose as well as, you know, kind of the existing uses. Thank you. I will say that at one point in time, um, community housing was the, I'd say they were backfilling it with CDBG funding, right? Um, that or affordable housing fund. Or affordable yeah. housing fund. Mm -hmm. I don't know that all those monies are available in the long term. So, yeah, any offset of any of these fees are directly related to the utility itself. Future rates. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that brings up another point when, it, when, we, when talking about rates, one of the big pieces you need to talk about and think about is the, the affordability of the rates for folks already in the community. Like keeping your rates appropriate and low, you know, given good service. If we want good water, we want those pipes replaced. But, you know, having, having folks in the community that might have affordability issues and, and those affordability issues can be measured different ways, and some of the measurements are scary. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not as familiar with Longmont's, but you know. And so, don't I, I really don't like offloading fee waiver costs to ratepayers because ratepayers ratepayers sometimes have affordability issues too. Yeah. Well, a third of our ratepayers have affordability yeah. issues. We it's also, a bigger, yeah. bigger piece than you think. Yeah, we have we have um, uh, good programs that are all free or nearly free um, to uh, help our ratepayers reduce their consumption, which helps with their individual affordability issues. Um, but of course, they're voluntary. We're also oh. fortunate to be able to offer the Longmont Cares program for. Well, that was the next thing on my mouth. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> and I, and, and um, because of something else, I was just wondering how, uh, what the, are we, are, am I blowing the schedule here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I thought we'd take just a minute and ask Dan and Scott if they have any questions at all. Good idea. Any questions, guys? I'm good. Scott? Yeah, that's a really nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, helpful. I, I didn't have any questions on you guys. Had some good ones. I'm all good too. Thanks. Okay. All right. Anyway, where were we? Oh, just wondering how we uh, uh, how how we fund the CARES fund because you know that's that's another thing. The the enterprise should be kicking in something for the CARES rebate. Yes, it, it is. Um, each of the enterprises that. It has a rebate. It, it's funded mm -hmm. you know, through through the rates. In the case of water, okay, the, this is how much magic money there is. Ready? Um, <laughs> we, we assume a, a a very small percentage of our usage is really at that very very top tier of um, you know we have the, the four tiers in the rate. Only about one percent of our usage comes in at that twenty five thousand gallon um, level. And when we project revenue from that, we don't we don't want to see usage there. We we think that that is excessive use in in single family homes. So when we project the revenue from that usage, we project that it's coming in at the next lowest um, tier. Uh, so we're funding the rebates with the difference. additional yeah with the difference in revenue between where where it really is charged and, and what we projected it when we are thinking about our long term. So uh, it's those profligate sure. users that are funding this, because they should. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you take into account when we have rainy years like this year? Do, do we not have as many people in that tier then? Or? Yes, yeah, I would expect that we're not going to have very much use in that tier at all. Yeah, we're uh, pretty low on revenue <laughs> currently. <laughs> Any other questions? Good presentation. Appreciate your time. Really good presentation. Thank you very much.
Okay. Any other agenda revisions? I have none. I just have one. Um, what we included in your packet, we included the uh, um, legislative uh, principles, and we, uh, we didn't get the most updated, and that's on me. Um, the difference, I can point out the two differences. It was um, from in that very first guiding water principle. Um, now it, it uh, just speaks to support policies. It, uh, these are changes that you you all recommended last year. It used to say support water policies. And, we, and it was asked to make it just policies, so we strike water. And then the other one was in uh, item number five. We added the word environmental, and that was in your guys' direction. So this reflects those two that didn't get in, in the one we so those are the two changes we have for you now. Okay. So what the board has in front of them um, is five different uh, items, one of which requires an action. I'll go through that one first. Uh, the first one is the villas at Spring Valley Final Plat. It's a 3.27 acre parcel along 66 and Sundance Drive. Uh, it's part of some land that was asked back in 1995. All the historic water rights were transferred to time of annexation. It, uh, after that application, it had a 0.55 acre foot. I don't want to separate you now from my next meeting, but it was a pleasure just meeting you briefly today and great presentation and amazing questions. So thank you. I'll be back at uh, some of the other meetings too. Good. Yes. <laughs> So Villas and Spring Valley final plat will be in compliance with the city's well water requirement policy upon satisfaction of 1.799 deficit at the time of final plat approval. Um, additionally, just um, for your own information, what's being proposed on this roughly three acre site is 28 single family attached residential units. Um, and so this is the one we're looking for uh, for board action on. If you have any questions, I can try to answer for you. That uh, Boulder County City of Longmont road, which road is this? 66. Okay. And then the one going north and south or top and down is something else you're Okay. This is that east of Pace? That's going to be east of Pace, yeah. We go east and keep working. It's the next street that connects to 66. Is on that street. It's kind of where to the left of that box, that golf course's maintenance facility. So just looking for recommendation on that, and then I'll go to the other. Any questions? You want to make a motion? Uh, I move that we recommend approval of provided they satisfy the estimates. Yep, we're so looking for them to come into compliance by satisfying the estimates. All right. All right. We move second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Okay. All right, the, the next four are just for informational purposes, but the uh, policy does uh, require the board to, to look at these. And that the first one of which was Horizon Park Shopping Center, Replat G. Generally speaking, it's it's uh, by Murdoch's and uh, the old Kmart up north on 66. Um, so in compliance, what's being proposed is the uh, uh, subdivision of replatting of seven new parcels. I do not know what's going to go into those, but you might think of maybe the parking lot being carved into some extra additional spots. I would think probably it's realistic to think that there might be some kind of business that would go into those new lots. So that's that one. The next one is uh, Wallace Edition 5th Filing, Replat A. So it's going to be on the uh, south side of Pike Road. West of Highway 287, and it's in compliance. And what's being proposed there is 
five new single family homes with mixed use. So it's a combination of residential, retail, and commercial. So it's taking one that was already platted and just subdividing it into five more lots. This is development full now. And there, it's got to be very close. There might be some enclave. I'm not exactly sure. A little piece that's still, but I think but all there are big chunks. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a couple vacant lots, but that's if you're, you're counting the apartment building that's right next to this. Yeah. Right? So they're they're at any time they could resubdivide, and that's what you're going to see. Probably most likely is replatting where they took a larger lot and subdivided it into maybe smaller lots or something all right. like that. The next one is Mountain Crest Subdivision Replant A. It's generally located east of Patel Road and south of, south of Maxwell Avenue. Um, that was part of the conveyance plat uh, back in 1999. What they're looking to do there is 13 single family detached residential units. So in there are about 13 lots on about two acres. And they're in compliance right now. And the last one is Connor Subdivision Replat C. It's kind of down by 2nd and Martin Street. Um, this particular one um, actually annexed, um, includes two annexations, both of which were prior to the formation of the Longmont Water Board. So that's why it's in compliance now. They're looking to do four apartments, two to four stories, including about 200 units within those four apartments. So. That's what's being proposed there. How many units? There's four apartments that would include a total of about 200 uh, apartment units. Okay, so, so we're about 50 of 50. 50. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. and so all those four that I just spoke of were in compliance, but just wanted to give that to you guys so you knew what was kind of going in. That's all I have for you. Any questions for Wes? All right. Thanks, Wes. General business, uh, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, um, we have before you today the um, 2024 legislative guiding water principles that we approve each year. These, once the um, water board has approved them, they're forwarded to council along with the city's broader um, water, uh, excuse me, broader legislative principles um, that the city council then um, approves and directs staff to look at all the legislation that will come up uh, starting January. Um, that's not too long from now. <laughs> um, we generally do this in October so that we can get them put together and set up to the city clerk's office who then compiles them all and they're approved by city council at the end of the year so that they're ready for the new legislative session starting in January. Um, very, you know, water boards review this every year for quite some time, but I uh, wanted to give you another shot at looking at them and if there's any additions or provisions or, uh, you would like, we'd be happy to have those before we order them on. For, can, or for Scott and Dan, can you just review the changes that are in the ones that we have? Right now. Sure. This, so, this is the old version. so uh, Dan and Scott, just to, if you're looking at an electronic version that was included in the packet, the difference again of what what I handed out in the re, uh, revision was in the first bullet item. Now it simply states support uh, policies that protect water. Um, and, and Scott, you were the one that brought that to everyone's attention last year at this time. And um, the second one was in item number five, where now we talk about including, we have a number of listed, but it also additionally includes environmental. So we're um, supporting appropriate uh, coordination of municipal water use with agriculture, recreation. We've now added environmental and open space. So, so broaden that particular one. Those are the two differences in what you're seeing on the electronic version. So I think what we're looking for is to see if there's anything else that you would like us to add or if you're in support of what we've got in front of you and, and then and looking for a lot of more recommendation. Okay. 
on these questions for what's it all? I mean, I, I don't know that this is a topic that needs to be resolved today, but I mean, at the very top, it expressly indicates that there's no priority or rank importance given to these. Um, of course, you know, the, the legislative world is all about priority, right? It, I mean, there's limited, uh, if, you know, if we had unlimited budgets, of course we wouldn't have to prioritize anything, but we have limitations. And so I'm curious, just from a long-term perspective, whether there is any interest in thinking about kind of priority or importance. Of course, that, that's just, I mean, now all of a sudden we've become I don't know, as as, uh, as divided or something as a as a legislative body might be or something, um, and so you know this certainly is sufficient to me, of course. But I'm just curious about whether there's any whether there would be any benefit in attempting to rank, for lack of a better word, these types of priorities. I don't know. I think you start ranking and uh, uh, yeah. I, uh, there's Before, letters, there's letters uh, prior to this version of these, um, that it was just a bulleted list, mm -hmm. and the board asked last year for us to number them so it would be easier for reference purposes. Yeah. So that's why they are numbered, but um, yeah. Yeah, and initially when I did look at it, I, I kind of like, I, I thought about some kind of inference associated with the numbers. That if, if we did it for a kind of a, a, like a pro, you know, mechanistic purpose or something just so we had numbers to reference. But if, but, but if you don't read the italics at the top, it almost kind of comes off as a random list. But, but, um, but in any event, yeah, that's a good reminder. I think Dan has a comment. Dan, you got a comment? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think the list is very thorough. Did I just lose everybody? We're still no, here. We're yeah. here. Yeah. Keep talking. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I, I think the list is very thorough. And, you know, as much as I guess the priorities change depending on the topic and what we're discussing. So I don't know if there's a need necessarily to. Try to list them in any given order or priority because, again, yeah, depending on the situation or the circumstances around the discussion, um, that priority may change over time. Marsha, you're going to say something? I was asking permission to say something. Well, um, you can go right ahead and start like, talking, yeah. Marsha. <laughs> we're, we're all waiting. Okay. Um, I'm 21. Um, I observed that uh, in a pre-pandemic, we had uh, the Climate Emergency Task Force, stuff like that, that you know, citizens groups actually tried to recommend policies, which this were properly rejected in those cases, in my mind, um, that would um, try to create policies that uh, stood in the way of um, the, our ability to develop municipal water sources. Um, now I think the political climate has changed enough that post-pandemic uh, we're probably not going to get any citizen initiatives to do that for a while. Um, but uh, I would, I would wonder if there are times when the board itself, um, in, in order to, to you know, adopt humane policies, might want to do that. So for example, if we had, if we had a, uh, a massive West Slope water crisis, would the board say we're taking more than our share? Because you know that was that was the presumption that the environmental faction had back in 2018 and 2019 it wasn't really true, but uh, but it could be true, you know, um, if if we you know if the if the predicted 
drought from the environmental model as ever comes along, um, worse than the one that we're historically have been in. So, do we need to think about that wording? Do, do, we, need, do we need to somehow give the board and the city a pass to, um, what am I sort of trying to say, not be grabby, you know, cons uh, consider not only the welfare of this municipality, but also the general welfare of the state. I'm asking. And there, there are a few in here that can't cover that, that type of thing. I mean, that we could point to if, if that was an interest. I mean, so 18, for example, future water supply solutions must benefit both the area of origin and the area of use. So, presuming that that West Slope water is coming you know, eastward. Um, I also think that, like, number one and number seven and number nine all reference Colorado's water resources, which is thinking of, you know, we're beholding to our customers, which is city of Longmont Bay Bears, mm -hmm. but our community is the big box that's Colorado. And so I think those speak to maybe some of that spirit already. Gives the board room to consider that when yeah. it's appropriate. Good. Consider bigger Colorado issues and, you know, Colorado's place in the Colorado River. In terms of prioritize over and above what the community's needs and interests are, I'm not saying that we shouldn't mm -hmm. look beyond ourselves. Well, certainly, so far the community has cooperated with with um, our efforts to make the behavior improvement way. So, it hasn't come up. Well, Tom, back to your comments. I, I'm kind of comfortable with the way it's laid out. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I think it's when the legislature cranks up, probably at that time, if there's some particular issues that come back at us, that would be the time to hone in on it. Comfortable the way it's laid out. I'm not saying I don't want to listen to your comments, but I'm. No, it, it was more so just a, a, a topic for consideration. I don't know necessarily what my own thoughts would be on the subject, to be honest. But the, the risk that, I mean, I, I like these, you know, kind of guiding principles. The, the problem that I always have with them is that you just stack so many on top of each other that suddenly they become less meaningful because there's because it says everything. It says we want to provide everyone with everything and not everybody should be happy, right? And and the, the danger in that then is that it also says nothing, right? And so I don't know that we're at that point, you know? I mean, it, it, um, but I, I'm sure that somebody, or for any issue, could find one of these principles that would cover them for any of them, right? And so then that that then then we become beholden to the interpreter of the of the principles, you know. So that that was my only concern. Again, I'm not necessarily advocating in one direction or another. So. Any other ifs, um, Scott and I? the flow. I've got to check off here. I've got to jump on a different call in two minutes. Um, I didn't have any specific concerns. We, we looked at these pretty hard last year. And I acknowledge the, the conversation um, that's gone on and there's some good thoughts in there. But I, I wasn't necessarily favorable to seeking a lot of patties at this particular time. Thanks, Scott. Any other, hey. any other comments? I, I think where we'll leave it is we're okay with the modifications you made and we'll move forward with uh, agreeing with these principles. Do you need, uh, do you need it would be helpful if someone would make a motion to that regard. Yeah. 
So, so I'll motion to adopt the 2024 legislative year guiding water principles in the city of Longmont as written in the new amended version. Okay. Do I second? I'll second. All right. Move and second. All in favor, signify say nay. Aye. Aye. All right. Very good. Okay. Items from staff. What else? Yeah, so um, coming uh, off of the presentation, just um, we recognize that the next quarterly review is scheduled for December. But from the review last month, um, kind of following the board's direction, we have started having conversations with other departments within the city of Longmont, uh, the public works and engineering team and planning team and the communications team to try to figure out the best way we, we're gonna be able to inform stakeholders, uh, both internal and external customers of future changes. And so we're working through that um, right now. Um, we've, we have each one of those departments bring their own perspective and their own talent. So it's good, it's, it's good. Um, it's been some good initial communication. So I wanted to put that out there that we are working on that aspect of it. Um, we, I also wanted to mention that as we go through the um, specifics, um, we talk about the number crunching, the numbers related to the windy gap and stuff. We we know that um, when you look at it in December, you know, you're going to find that there's was a range of numbers that came through with those eight units that Platte River had. They ranged from 3.8 million per unit to 4.5 million. And we know that there's an average, um, it, it's kind of close to 4 million. Um, so we'll be, we're gonna be able to bring that, that specific data to you. In, in talking with PRPA, they are anticipating um, taking two of the three cells. So there's five units that, rep that are represented through three different um, transactions. That are planning and thinking that probably the two of the three will go in front of the sub district board in December and it would be just prior to your December meeting and then the other one would be sometime in the first quarter that's what they're thinking so the PRPA board has already given approval to accept these bids it's already in place but the actual transaction, the authority to make these transactions comes from the the uh, Northern Subdistrict Board. They're the ones that say, yes, you can sell it to, or transfer it to uh, party A, B, and C. And so that's the, that's their projected timeline for that. And then lastly, I was just gonna mention, um, go ahead. I, I need that said again slower okay. and differently, and maybe let me just ask the question. So okay. the PRPA Board has determined which of those they'll accept. They've already given the approval to accept all three. All three? Three bids that represent five units. Got it, okay. And so they basically accepted the price, and now That's they're correct. waiting on Northern to yeah. approve those. To approve those, okay. Mm -hmm. But that gives us a fixed price, right? That's that's correct. Great, okay. Yes, that's exactly right, Renee. And and, uh, the, and I can tell you, they've shared it with me and told me that I can share this with you. The, the average price for the selected, so of eight units that were bid on. So you have, you have five different people asking for a total of eight units. Okay. And the average of that was $4,160,000 per unit. Um, the average for the selected bids, so the, the, the three bids that represent the five units that they're trying to sell was $4,037,500 per unit. So those are the numbers and the details we'll, we'll put back in writing in December. Okay. That kind of gives you a barometer. They, the, the lowest bid was 3.8 million, the highest was 4.5, and the average was kind of in the middle. And so that's where, um, where they stand. 
Did that answer that question for you, Renee? It did. Okay. Thanks so much. I'm so glad we've got a number. Yeah. So, um, I'm not hanging out. Now. Right. And so, um, just we, we continue to keep a finger on the pulse of what's going on with CBT. Even though that doesn't establish our cash and loot, that's not the barom that's not what we're using to base um, cash and loot on. It's nice to understand where that's at. And in the in the past, those were those numbers were coming in in the around seventy thousand dollars a unit, somewhere in that. It's um, it looks like right now that market is softened a little bit. It's probably in the around the sixty five thousand dollar. A unit range and the thought was what we're hearing is that a lot of that has to um, demand as interest rates have went up there's not as many people that are willing to take cash off the sidelines to buy it and and so therefore their the supply that's out there can't command quite as high a price so it's kind of softening a little bit but uh, still close to where it was it's, it's certainly not back down to the Twenty or thirty thousand dollar unit, and, and just to remind, when we look at CBT, the accredited yield we give for a unit of CBT is 0.76. So it's still, you know, it's still um, in the eighty, ninety thousand uh, dollar per unit or per acre foot range for CBT. It's that number is still um, quite a bit higher than uh, what a current cash flow is. So that was kind of just the update. Not looking for any uh, any action. Just wanted to keep let you know that we're we're doing what you ask us, and we're working through that policy. And I expect next month we'll give you some further updates when we're coming through with the uh, uh, communication internally and how we might best feel like we're covering everyone. We're wanting to make sure anyone that might be affected gets notice of any future change, no matter what size that might be. So as far as the timing of us adopting an adjusted number, mm -hmm. um, do you think when do you think we will have the information we need to come up with a firm decision? I, I think in the December, December. in your December meeting, okay. your your scheduled next quarterly meeting, we're going to be able to have that number, and hopefully you guys feel like you have enough information that maybe you can make a decision what you want to do with cash at that time. All right. Very good. Any questions? Okay, moving on. Hope, are you down there? Mm -hmm. You're I'm on. ready. All right. All right. So, um, since the last time we met, we uh, did our Kensington Park grass to garden project. So just as a brief reminder, this was a turf transition project that we identified with the help of um, art and public places. Um, we received Colorado Water Conservation and state funding to do this project. And our public places helped us identify this site at Kensington Park um, because there's a mosaic there that's being damaged by um, water hitting it and the mowers and weed whackers and all those types of things. So our public places was going to remove the grass anyways, and so we thought, what a good example of a project to um, be cross departmental and put in some zero native flowers. So we had um, we worked with Northern Water and Denver Botanic Gardens to create a zero native plant planting garden, and then um, we engaged the community throughout the whole process. So we did a lot of community engagement. We had events. Um, on site so that they could be a part of the design process. They got to choose what kinds of plants they wanted to see, uh, what they wanted the gardens to look like. Um, and then on the 23rd of September, we had the planting event. And so we invited all of the Kensington Park community to come out and actually plant the plants in the ground. So we had 59 community volunteers come out. Yeah, it was really successful. That's rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> um, we planted 354 plants. We gave away 99 plants, um, zero plants. Um, and then, so that we removed 3,000 square foot of turf grass. And we're estimating a water savings of 180,000 gallons per year. And then I just have some photos of the day that I thought you guys would like to see. 
So that's what it looked like before. That's the mural um, surrounded by all that green grass. Um, they did not remove the turf until like the Tuesday before our Saturday event. So we were a little nervous, <laughs> but we had we had really good contractors. They were on, they were right on it. They removed all the turf grass, um, amended the soil. Next slide, please, Heather. Thank you. And then put in all of the the mulch. Um, we used pea gravel, what we call in the industry squeegee, which is the best management practice for um, zero plants as well as an ADA um, path so that folks in wheelchairs can get up to the mural and all around in the garden. Um, so lots of community members, lots of kids, huge families, um, and then, yeah, you could just scroll through that, thank you. And um, this, this barren ground right here will be um, grass. So that big area in the front is gonna be where um, we're gonna do dog tough, which is a plant select um, hybrid from a uh, native grass in Africa. So super drought resistant and um, tolerant to dogs, which is why we call it dog tough. And then some native grasses as well. I put this in here because um, that sweet old man in the wheelchair uh, to show that this is ADA compliant. She rolled her dad right up there. Uh, we had, that's a choke cherry tree, which is one of the trees that were requested by the community. Lots of youth, which was really great. And so those kids were really excited about the tree and they kept saying, oh, I can't wait to see my tree in a couple of years and watch our tree grow. So it was really a special, really a special event. Um, we were able to partner with Neighborhood Group Leaders Association. So they're the ones who did the boots on the ground, community engagement, outreach, flyering. We used the youth center to put flyers on every door in the, in the Kensington neighborhood. Um, and we were able to use ARPA funding um, so we used this as a community enrichment event post-COVID, uh, and we were able to get some sweet cow and um, breakfast burritos and coffee and a bunch of other, re we did a resource fair, so sustainability was there, and um, Longmont Public, or Longmont Food Rescue, all those types of things. We did a large um, resource fair there too. And that's what it will look like when it's all, um, grown and established, we're thinking it'll be about three years. And so right now, with each passing year with Zero Gardens, um, the water use decreases significantly. So this first year, we won't see huge water savings, but then we'll increase. Um, and then after our third year, we're expecting to not irrigate at all. So um, yeah, just wanted to share that successful project with you guys. It was really a wonderful example of our Growing Water Smart um, initiative of how cross-departmental work and collaboration is really important. I mean, being able to work with Art and Public Places and Neighborhood Group Leaders Association and Sustainability and the Youth Center and um, Parks and Open Space were there and Natural Resources and, and our volunteer community or our volunteer coordinator was there. It was just really a special event to be part of. So. Very successful. Yeah. Any pushback from I got one phone call and she was like, why are you tearing out our beautiful grass? <laughs> and all I had to do was explain that we're going to put something more beautiful in there. And she was really excited. So it'll be fine. She was worried we were going to tear out the whole park. Oh. I'm like, no, no, just this park. 3,000 square feet seems like a lot of grass, um, but it's a huge park. So yeah. there's still lots of room to walk around in grass and play. Oh, great. It's a great project. Thank you. I'm very successful. Thanks a lot. Anything else, Wolf? Okay. Uh, Heather, can you put up the yep, major point. project listings? Anybody have any comments on? The way this is laid out, questions or comments? All right. Can any comments on? No. All right. All right. Um, any informational items or? 
Or nope, boxes? just the stuff that was included in the packet. Okay. Yep. All right. Items for tentatively scheduled for future meetings. Is there anything else that we need to bring forward? Anything else for the good of the cause? Dr. Lynn Jordan. 